you're dealing with one, two, or three, maybe all of the top problems of content marketers and SEO professionals. The first is lack of resources. The second is not being sure what's producing results. And the third is time to results. We are here to solve those problems inside of the conversation of how to prepare for the rebound. Let's all talk about, we're talking with top um, market, content marketers and business leaders about how to prepare so that we can come out the other side of this better, stronger, faster. Um, you're not alone and we're gonna get this handled. I'm so excited today. We have Sergio Samel with us. Thank you, Sergio, for playing today. You're welcome. Thank you, and thank you for having me, Leslie. Ah, it's my pleasure. Sergio is an EOS implementer and both a predictive index and Colby certified partner. He serves the lower to mid market and has shepherded more than 70 companies through the EOS process. You can find more from Sergio, some great content at getbusinessmomentum.com. And he's actually my EOS implementer too. So thanks for all the guidance, Sergio. Uh, and the pleasure of working with you and your team, uh, Leslie. Such um, you know, really special and extraordinary people. They are great, aren't they? Yes, Absolutely. thank you very much. Yeah, I agree, I couldn't agree more. So I'd like to hear from you because you have a unique position of getting to work with so many different companies in that mid to lower market size, what are you seeing are the positives coming out of this experience we're having of COVID-19? Well, there are lots of positives. And, you know, uh, when, when I see, say this to people, they tend to look at me and say, well, you know, what, what have you been smoking today? <laughs> because they are so hunkered down in this mode of dealing with stuff. But yes, and I say, you know, we are all dealing with the constraints and the limitations and the frustrations at times of the situation. But there are lots of positives. So one thing from my perspective, being a, a, an implementer of a system that uh, essentially runs um, low mid-market uh, companies, is that, you know, when, when resources and markets shrink, the merits of having an operating system that actually uh, helps uh, operate a business more efficiently, more effectively, essentially go come up to, to the surface. Because, you know, when, when you have more resources than you need, then you have a lot of room to, to essentially make mistakes and nobody will notice. Because, you know, profits are high, markets are growing and so forth. So that's one thing. So, so that's the, the business. It side. covers up for weaknesses. Exactly, exactly. And then the other side is also the side that has to do with people. You know, when you need to actually shrink, for example, somewhat your organization, or you're looking to figure out, you know, what kind of organization you need for the next uh, stage or, or for the rebound, as you call it, um, Leslie, uh, again, the need to actually have the right people in the right seats. And as you know, we have a lot of tools in the OS that are focused specifically on that. And then, of course, we add you know, the Colby and the predictive index tools to uh, empower us to really have the right people in the right seats. All of that stuff becomes much more important now. And again, uh, much more relevant to how we operate the business. Um, so that's the second thing. The, the third, you know, kind of silver lining to this is that, um, which is a totally different uh, area, uh, you know, like you, you are dealing with customers. And uh, um, in the past, uh, most of the way I'm dealing with customers most of the time is through these um, day long on site or physical sessions you know i would fly to akron ohio for example where you know have a couple of customers including uh, you know some of your friends and and spend spend the day with the leadership team so now of course that is not happening so people have become much more accustomed to actually uh, be uh, receptive to dealing with uh, people like myself virtually 
And that has been actually a discovery for my people. In fact, you know, one of my clients <laughs> told me something very interesting. They, the, a couple of the people on the leadership team were very reluctant to move to, to do this virtually. And in fact, they were kind of hoping that this thing is going to finish really soon so that I can go back and actually meet with them physically. And I said to them, no, 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 it's important to keep the rhythm on. So reluctantly, they accepted. And we broke the session instead of a full day in front of a screen, we broke it into a, a, a couple of pieces. At the end, one of the, the shares that they, uh, and, and the observations they made, the same people, were that, my God, in fact, not only that this has been working much better than I expected, but you know, I think I would like us to continue to do this forever, virtually. Because all of a sudden they saw there are aspects of, uh, of this work that are much better done in smaller, um, shorter, um, you know, mini sessions, like say three, four hours a day uh, for a couple of days, as opposed to a nine hour one, one time sitting. So, so, so there are actually three things, at least, that I see as positives or silver linings to, uh, to the pandemic um, situation. First um, is about uh, company strength, especially on the operating side. So people have are starting to realize when resources and market, shift, market shifts, that it is more important for, for the company to actually function very well. Second is about the people inside the company. When uh, the staff either shrinks or even the stays the same, or even if it grows, the need to actually make sure that you have the right people in the right seats becomes substantially more important. And thirdly is that people who historically have not been very, uh, let's say, accommodating doing work remotely, all of a sudden they've noticed that in fact, in some aspects, especially when they're dealing with, uh, you know, EOS implementers or coaches like myself, doing things remotely has its merits that in some areas work even better than having to spend a full day in the same room. Great. Yes. And it certainly is easier when there's abundance of resources, market share prospects. We don't see those weaknesses in, in our companies as uh, clearly as we see them now. So it's a great time to do some housekeeping and examine who do we have the right people in the right seats. And especially if part of the team has been furloughed, knowing the resources that you have, I understand that's what the uh, predictive index tool does, helps you understand uh, what people are geared for. So you've got the best shot at, at uh, a strong rebound. Got it. Great. Of course. Awesome. So do you see anything then that's possible for people now because of the COVID-19 experience that wouldn't have been if we hadn't had it or weren't in it? Well, um, we learn new skills that otherwise most people, including, you know, business coaches and, and uh, consultants uh, like myself uh, just wouldn't do because we were busy just delivering our services. Um, there are facilitation skills, for example, that uh, we have to learn and sharpen that um, apply to working with people virtually that, you know, normally we wouldn't have because we will mostly work with people uh, in the, you know, face to face. Um, there are um, uh, ways of actually structuring our products and services in a way, you know, I'll give you just one simple example. Uh, in, in, in the system that I implement for, for my clients, we have these 90-day cycles. Well, 90 days in this particular context is a long time. So one thing that we learn is that, you know, maybe we can take that cycle and break it down into two pieces of 45 days. So instead of being a quarter, is an eighth. Well, it actually works out very well. Now, I'm not saying that we will shift from 90 to 45 forever. But when things happen at such a speed, you have to be actually mindful of what you're doing. And this is something that to, 
answer your question straight, uh, Leslie, I don't think I would have ever, ever considered unless I was forced to like we are right now. So it's just uh, two simple examples of that. So pivots can create opportunities exactly. as you're adjusting to rapid change. Absolutely. And such, yeah, and chaos in some instances and overflowing demand in others. Yeah, great, got it. Okay, so what have you or your peers, your other EOS integrators, implementers rather, um, or the teams organizations that you are serving, what are you seeing on the court that they're doing to prepare for and be in a great position for the rebound? Well, a, a number of things. So for example, in my business, one of the things that I have uh, shifted or pivoted as uh, somehow this verb has become the, fa the most favorite word in the English language to most people in business um, is, um, you know, is to, to I, I took a look at what would be a service that can actually help people with an issue that they are facing with right now, right here. And one of the things that occurred to me is that people are facing with a lot of change very rapidly, both business strategies as well as people. Don't have to get into any details, you understand what kinds of changes. So the question is, well, when you change everything all at once, are those things actually in sync with each other so that you can guarantee that when you come out of the, in a rebound, let's say three months from now or six months from now, is this company actually going to work the way you expected it to work? And it turns out that Predictive Index has a tool and a whole infrastructure to give you a science-based assessment and a facilitation basis to solve exactly that, that question so that you are not walking into this with your eyes closed. So I packaged that as a, uh, as a new service and I've been actually getting a lot of uh, traction because people see, yes, that's exactly the kind of issue I'm dealing with because I have no idea where I'm going with this. You know, I mean, I've never had to change things so fast in so many directions all at the same time. So that's one example of, you know, you have to re-examine what is it that you are actually putting out there. That doesn't mean that it subtracts from other products, but you just put something in more of a, you know, uh, in, 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 in the light, because that actually responds to the, the reality today. So that's one thing. Um, you know, um, preparing for m and, 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 and spending time and energy on creating a marketing machine that fuels lead generation, that fuels business development activities, the, you know, the conversations, is also something that I put a lot of efforts and lots of people put a lot of efforts on. And the reason is that, yes, maybe right now people are may be less inclined to close business right away, depending on, of course, what you're selling. But once we start getting into a rebound, that's basically what you need to have very, uh, you know, functioning very well. So fine tuning and, and completing your marketing machine, which may not have been your, um, your um, you know, priority three months ago, uh, all of a sudden becomes, interestingly enough, a, ver a very high level of priority. So that's something that many people are working on um, uh, uh, quite a bit. Yeah. So, Sergio, what are you seeing your clients? What skills are they learning that will serve them in the rebound? Uh, the skill of being agile. Mm -hmm. That, you know, uh, when an issue rises to the surface and uh, the leadership team says, boy, you know, this is something that's biting us in the rear end. Don't put it on, uh, you know, uh, what we call in the OS, as you know, on the parking lot. We are going to deal with it some other time. You've got to actually go and solve it right away, even if the solution is imperfect. There, there's a category of, of leaders 
they tend to want to come up with a brilliant solution, the long-term solution. That's great. But right now, we also have to have a solution that would work at least partially right now. So that's mm -hmm. one skill that many people are, are I can see people actually uh, getting. It's like you said earlier, that the weaknesses, and my, it would be a weakness at a company if they didn't have agility or be able to yeah. cause themselves to move quickly or change quickly, that this is putting a spotlight on that. So and they're being forced to grow that skill. Yeah, and okay. along those same lines, uh, Leslie, is also um, looking at the, the relationships among the, say, the members of the leadership team or among the people in various teams and so forth. And uh, while in the past, maybe people were more likely to be willing to tolerate, uh, you know, friction or not so uh, functional teams, um, to tolerate some level of uh, dysfunctionality, you know, you can't afford that anymore. You cannot afford, you are not going to survive if your leadership team, for example, is dysfunctional. Because it's, it's in the same category of what you, you were saying a minute ago, Leslie. You know, yes, dysfunctionality is, is a, you know, is a weakness. But now that weakness may, that weakness may be fatal. Because you got to get people on the same page so they can actually march, and uh, you know they they really can lead the rest of the organization in a coherent way, uh, and that's more important than ever right now. So you're seeing that those weaknesses that they could tolerate in the past are now exactly. potentially game stops. Exactly, exactly. So it, so some mm -hmm. people understand that and they take action. And some people, you know, sort of like go into the fear or freeze mode. And unfortunately, uh, not to be crass about it, but literally they're not going to survive. Yeah, I hear and, you uh, saying that there are certain leadership styles that can make it through certain types of environments. And this is not one of them. Exactly. Exactly. You got it. Yep. That's, a, that's important to, um, I hear what you're saying, and I, I get that one of the things that you've done to prepare your own practice for the rebound is you've developed some step-down offers. Right. So you have your core offering, and you've, you're doing the predictive, the PI work, the predictive index work to help people understand themselves and their teams better. Yeah, that's, that's right. smart. Are you seeing other clients creating step-down offers so that they can keep clients that might have otherwise on, on pause or um... yeah like for example I have a um, an IT company a managed services company as a client and they have actually uh, you know IT companies by the way uh, potentially can be winners in this game because everybody as you can imagine especially with people working from home everybody has an increased appetite and need for various IT things to be taken care of but at the same time you got to be careful because you know when you, your service costs go higher well at the same time people are not very quick to pay these days because their cash flow is an issue so you have to really manage this thing well so uh, which requires that your services need to be scaled down and narrowed. So one of the things that they are doing is not, it's not as much as of a step down as it is putting a sharper boundaries as to what is it that they are actually servicing. So there is less uh, the lack of clarity or, or better set of expectations on the client side. Uh, and I think that's a very smart move that they are taking and uh, that actually will help, uh, you know, essentially contribute to their to their gross margins. Uh, otherwise, so uh, you're seeing clients getting clear on expectations and improving their communication skills with their customers, maybe along with tightening up the timeline or the offering, shaving some off so that uh, it's a smaller price and less out for collections. Uh, I'm not sure about the smaller price, but I'm also because it's I, less work. I meant like maybe bites, bite chunks, chunking exactly. out work instead of one big project, exactly. so they can invoice consistently and see if there's going to be a collections issue. Exactly. I got it. Okay. 
So what about our experience of COVID-19 has surprised you, Sergio? Well, um, you know, there, I've, I, I, I was surprised by how polarized the world of leaders is. Let me explain what I mean. There, uh, there, there, there's a category of leaders that I dealt with, that I'm dealing with, uh, business leaders, that have exceeded my expectation. They really rose to the occasion. They've embraced their customer base really high. They've been, they've renewed their, you know, uh, their um, uh, efforts. They work you know, literally like crazy incessantly to support all their constituencies, meaning their customers, their people inside the organization, even when they have to to make the unpleasant uh, kinds of choices or, you know, to, with furloughs and so forth. And at the same time, I've actually uh, known and I, I I know a lot of uh, business leaders who, to be to, to put it bluntly, uh, Leslie, they, they really broke my heart because I've seen them basically kind of hunker down and become small. Uh, it's sort of getting into this uh, survival, in their minds, the survival mode means you basically freeze and you do the minimum amount of stuff so that you don't spend too much energy and therefore you are, have a, like, a higher likelihood of survival. Uh, uh, or you essentially kind of uh, uh, want to appear that you are engaged, but you are really not engaged. Um, uh, they, they so you're seeing some leaders who are really stepping up and shining and others are really overwhelmed. That's, and that actually has, uh, has surprised me because there are some people that I was thinking personally very highly of. And they, like I said, they just broke my heart. They, I'm looking at them and I can't get them to, to essentially shake off that fear and really be the leaders that they should. Cause it's, you know, it's easy to be a leader, easier to be a leader when everything is all lined up and works well. You know, it's it's when things are not that way that the real brass shows starts showing up. I hear you. So it's not just uh, the weaknesses in a company, but our weak, the weaknesses in us as individuals are easier to spot during these times. So it can be really clear about what there is to, to take on. So we are prepared for the rebound. And, and then the, way, by, the next by, time something happens, we're in a better spot. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I was going to say so. And by weaknesses, what I mean, Leslie, is really, uh, you know, like actions that people take. So I'm not talking about their character faults or something. I don't even look at them as character faults. I'm just looking at what they do or not do. And uh, some of the leaders do you know, 10 times more than what I expected them to do. And others, they do just a fraction of what I would expect them to do as leaders. And uh, and they make that choice. And unfortunately, that choice uh, is sometimes very sad because it really... Why do you think, think some leaders make the choice to double down and others um, just hmm. take a squat? Yeah. <laughs> That's a great question, Leslie. I, you know... I don't know exactly. Uh, I, I sometimes I question their commitment, and sometimes I just um, uh, you know uh, there's there's this fine line being uh, in inside me that I'm walking between. On one hand, being em you know empathetic to them. I mean, everybody is having a hard time. There's no question, you know, people having, you know, now they have to work from home, they have little kids. I mean, it's like a million things. So there's the empathetic part. And then there is this other part that says, come on, grow up. And some people just, just they can't get themselves uh, to, to grow up. And um, uh, to, to get back to your question, why? Honestly, and I'll be brutally honest with you, I have no idea. At the, fundamentally, at the bottom, what makes one be this way or that way? <laughs> it's hmm. uh, People kind of make that choice in some fashion, and 
you know, some people make the right choice and, you know, we are all in awe with them and some people just, just fall short. I wonder if it's an opportunity for self-awareness to see if you're going with uh, the survival instead of stepping up and taking action that might be Absolutely. scary or... Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You're... you're you're spot on, uh, Leslie. Of course, there is, uh, and and you know, self awareness, which is the first step, and then self development. You know, kind of uh, allowing your inner you to kind of override all these patterns with, you know, so that uh, you know the definition of courage is not the absence of fear. The definition of courage is taking actions in the presence of fear, in spite of fear. So I'm not saying that people should not be fearful. Of course we are all fearful. And you you recognize, your, like you said, you have self-awareness, you recognize that fear, and then you set it aside, and you go and act anyway. Well, this is great experiential learning in lots of ways. So it's a, yeah, every time we go through something, whether it's, you know, be on this scale, but we knock wood, come out the other side with capabilities, capacity that we didn't prior. Absolutely. And mm. That's true. That's true. And, uh, you know, it's uh, like, like we said, it's also one of the silver linings of this is that, you know, it shows us very clearly, it separates very clearly who are really true leaders and who are, just pretending because you know there's a lot of talk out there <laughs> it's very easy to to talk a lot and do little very easy and um so Sergio, how has this affected how you are working with your clients or how your clients are working internally now that you've been pushed into the position of doing your work remotely mm -hmm. and in the past you've done it in person a lot of in-person work yeah, so 90 before this, 90% of my work historically, I've done in person in the room with the leadership team. So, yes, uh, of course, uh, the impact is total because I'm doing 100% of uh, the work right now virtually. Uh, and um, so, one of, so one of the things that we discovered is that people who have historically been reluctant to do anything remotely, all of a sudden discover that, you know, things actually can work. It, 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 it created the need for both me and them, which is the leadership team, to develop skills, different skills, so that we can deal with this different medium. You know, uh, for example, as simple as, you know, you can have six people speak at the same time. You know how in Zoom you always have one person and it's highlighted well? Yes. you got to actually have that kind of patience and that kind of self-awareness to wait for somebody to end the sentence before you say something. Um, and the, of course, this is a very small thing, but it impacts and people learn that because, you know, people can hear. You know, they see your mouth moving, but they can't hear what, they, what you're saying. So, overall, um, the experience has been actually very positive. Now, the other thing that has happened as a result of it is that the leadership team itself, which is now, of course, forced to do work virtually themselves, as opposed to being in the same room, has, has actually learned new skills on how to do that. Which means not only interpersonal skills, but also... Um, fundamental, you know, they, they are looking for new tools to do that. I mean, I don't know how many people have been starting talking about Slack, for example, which in the past was not even on their radar screen, because now they need something that's more fluid so that the conversation can go at a certain speed that's different than when they used to be basically the in the in the office next door, you can actually go and for pop in for two minutes and, and get uh, something going. So right. all of these but things create... I hear it's a reinforcing respectful communication, respect amongst teams, exactly. and then ingenuity and invention and recreation. That's great. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. So a lot of skills, a lot of, um, a lot of um, human behavioral adaptation, which I think in general is all positive because the more um, adaptable we are as 
individuals, as human beings, and as teams in the team dynamic, the more likely we are to actually, ex, you know, uh, um, exceed, excel in under pressure. Hmm, that's great. Agility, the ability to adapt. Right. Yeah, all of these things will serve us in the rebound for certain. Yeah. That's by by the way, that is the core of being human. I mean, the, you know, one thing that, that that is very different about humans versus any other, say, animal, is that we historically have found ways to survive. To we are not behaving the same way that we were behaving two thousand years ago. Uh, there are some things that are continue to be part of, you know, the, the, the same way. But many other things are very different. Uh, forget about 2000, even 200 years ago, you know. When was the last time you hopped on a horse and a buggy, right? Not me. <laughs> so I know you've worked remotely for a number of years. So your day-to-day -day work, other than not traveling, I guess that, that still is a significant change. Anything else about any other changes to how you work that um, you're surprised by or didn't anticipate? Well, so I used to, I would say, probably spend about 50% of my time here in my office, in my home office, in front of two large screens. And then the other 50% was divided for, uh, between um, uh, client sessions, uh, business development meetings, uh, networking meetings, things of that nature. Of course, now everything is here, right? Uh, uh, so... To some extent, uh, I've had the privilege of not having to change that much like other people have. But also, at the same time, you know, there has been changes. I have to be careful not to, you know, sit down in front of my screens at 5 a.m. and not get up until, you know, 9 p.m. Uh, it would be easy to do that and there will be an extremely unhealthy behavior. And uh, yes, it can be probably sustained for a couple of weeks, uh, but not further than that. So I have to actually be much more rigorous with my rhythms, with, with the fact that I have to take breaks, that I have to go outside. I mean, things that before I didn't have to literally even think about it because they were part of, you know, now I have to actually put those things, they're, they're literally on my calendar, like get out. I mean, when was the last time you put on your calendar, get out of the house for 25 minutes, you know? So now they are there. So that has been um, a change. Um, what tools I use I, are also shifting a little bit. Uh, there are more people out there that uh, are easier, more facile with tools that in the past, uh, you know, I was reluctant to, <clears throat> uh, to promote because, you know, I didn't want to start having to, you know, teach people how to use Zoom. Now, Using a, hopping on a Zoom conference has become no different than giving somebody your phone number, literally. I mean, here's a number, go and, go and join my Zoom at three o'clock, great. So it's the same, the same facility, so I have no issues with that, so I'm, I'm delighted. Um, but other, other tools as well. So there have been some, some shifts even for, for me uh, um, from where I was, you know, two, three months ago to how I'm doing work uh, right now. All right, Leslie, well, have a great uh, rest of the day. Thanks, you too, Sergio. Appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Oh, of course. My pleasure, always. Bye. Take care. Bye.